this is uniparentally inherited. This is a, a Y chromosome uh, passed from father to son to son to son. This particular DNA marker here, PN2, is sort of the background, and that's what this means, is the background of 73% of all of the peoples in Africa today. 73%. The PN2 is found in West Africa and sub-equatorial Africa. I mean, rather, I'm sorry, the P2 or M2 is, as it's called. This M35, 215M35, is what you find in the Horn of Africa up to Egypt and over to Morocco. It corresponds to the 5 and the 11 in the previous slide. This is the father of both groups of Africans. This binds the continent together, okay? So although you have Berbers with blue eyes and blonde hair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they share, for the most part, this PN2 ancestry with people in West and Tropical Africa. This is the modern population. And they share much less of the M89, which comes off the tree, in another way. I'm going to finish here. This is an old slide. Uh, I'll just stop here. Okay, well, that's where it stopped anyway, doesn't it? Okay, all right. Any questions uh, about uh, Schumacher's presentation? Okay. You, you mentioned about uh, there being no European 60,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell me when they first went into Egypt? When the Mediterranean people first went into Egypt? When, when I talk about 60,000 years ago, there being no modern people in Europe, what I'm saying is the best evidence that we have for modern people being anatomically, what we call modern, anatomically modern people in any part of Europe is, is at the outside 40,000 years, okay? And when you talk about Mediterranean people, we need to talk about that later on because, uh, as I have said and tried to say, Africans don't all look alike. So some of what you're calling Mediterranean people are just some more Africans, okay? Now, you have to get your arms around that. And that's what that last slide was about with the PN2 transition. Because most of the people there who have that PN2 transition, that particular gene, that genealogy, in its derived form is M35. For example, Berbers are M35, M81. Those people don't look like Congolese. But I'm trying to have you understand that they are carrying genealogically, in terms of their male ancestry at least, they're carrying something that ties them to the rest of the continent and does not tie them to Europe, even though physically, externally, you may say, well, gee, they look like Europeans. You understand what I'm saying? So when you ask me, when did X, we don't use those concepts of Mediterranean race, Alpine race, Nordic race, all that, that's from another era. You know, there, it's descriptive. And in actual fact, you will find, uh, you can find individuals all over the, the world who might conform to one of those, those sort of categories. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So then, uh, That's so, the same thing they say about being Arab. Arab is uh, a culture, not a race. It means traveling person. Okay, but I'm, I'm trying to understand. What are you, what are you asking me here? Well, you ask me, very specifically, you ask me, when did Mediterranean people get to Egypt? I don't know what you mean by Mediterranean, but let me, uh, but let me repeat that myself. Don't look African. No, well, there's more than one way to be African. There's more than one way to look African. There's more than one way to look Asian. There's one way to, more than one way to be Asian. That is what you have to, um, from my perspective as an evolutionary biologist, that's what you have to get your arms around. The people in southern India are just as Asian as the people in northern China, who are just as Asian and the people from, as Asian as the people from the Eurasian steppes. You know, they don't look alike. And you measure them, they don't look alike. Okay. Yeah. Let me put it another way. For example, you have uh, Elizabeth Taylor playing Cleopatra. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. Well, what do you mean? What are you well, talking when about? When did that sort of look into Egypt? The, the thing is, is that, number one, who, who was Cleopatra? I'm asking you. <laughs> well, well, what I'm saying, Cleopatra was probably a Macedonian. Well, she was a Macedonian. From, from near Greece. Yeah. Yeah, that's what right. I mean. When did people that look like that go into Egypt? Well, I don't know about Elizabeth Taylor specifically. And, uh, uh, you know, very specifically. But I would dare to say that within the Nile Valley, within the Nile Quarter, within super-Saharan Africa, there have always been people who were lighter skinned and straight ahead from 60,000 years ago. Always. They're not new. That's my whole point. In fact, I could make the argument 
that that kind those kinds of characteristics actually originate in Africa. Yeah, that they didn't come from someplace else. Yeah. They're part of of modern humanity or they're part of humanity. And there's no reason to believe that they could not have originated in Africa. Incidentally, incidentally, skin color can flip back and forth from an evolutionary point of view, we we now know, every fifteen thousand or so years. It's not the sort of thing that you know, it takes 100,000 years, million years to live in one place. And, and skin color itself is not always an accurate index, even in current situations like in Brazil and Venezuela. It doesn't necessarily give you a proportionate amount of ancestry. You can have people with very fair skin, but actually have more, quote unquote, black ancestors than some people who are actually darker. So you have to be very careful about what you think you can quantify from that, again, based on science evidence. Now, there, the issue of having narrow features, a narrow face, and what have you, we have remains, and normally I would show you this slide, but I, you know, we're not going to get to that today, of people from Gamble's Cave in East Africa down in Kenya that are probably about 10 to 12,000 years old. If you measure them up and submit them to a forensic type analysis, they'll cluster with Europeans. They're not Europeans. Their limb ratios are as tropical as you can be. They come from right there. That's what you have to get on. Uh, Charlie, uh, you could ask more questions yeah, later. I'd like to give okay. somebody else a chance, and uh, you can carry on later, yeah? Anybody else? Okay, we need to stop. Oh, okay, sorry, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you place stock in Darwin's um, theory of evolution, and I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea from what the questions I'm hearing is. I mean, what would you define, then, as an African? I don't define an African or the African. There is a matrix of variability that constitutes a description of an African reality. Very different notion. The moment you start defining things with narrow terms and in particular ways and a non scientific for something that's as fluid as this is the moment that you will get into trouble because then you're going to be forced to explain things, uh, like I said, with typological methods or deductive methods when they don't fit. Okay? It's a shame we ran out of time for this section because that would have been really fascinating. It's just that you said there's an, and I do hear your point, there's a diversity within the African identity or, or spectrum. It, it just feels that if there is no, I mean, we don't just need to talk about the African identity. I mean, I, I, I'm again, I, I don't subscribe to the notion of race either. But I, I think if we're using terms like African or Egyptian, which is probably more geopolitical in that context, but if, if we're using terms like that to, to define a reality, surely there must be a boundary, or so it isn't diversity we're talking about, we're talking about an entirety of the human race, which is one, and then, and then we start to lose... No, no, you don't lose Where's it because you have... Where's the boundaries for the diversity? No, no, you don't, you don't lose anything because you have your model-based approach. You have uh, a real history of a species that emerged in Africa. You have some real fossils. You have some real people that you can look at. You have some real DNA evidence that ties together. Frankly, I was quite astounded when I found that, that the, when the Y chromosome data got produced, they didn't have that 25 years ago when I first started on this adventure. Uh, but, but I am pleased to say that I, that I wrote, and you can get my master's thesis, I wrote, I said, there's no theoretical reason why these Berbers from Algeria couldn't be, have share common ancestors in the late Pleistocene. And sure enough, 20 years later, when the DNA came out, because what most people would say is they look at these Berbers, and I have pictures of them, they say, oh, these are descendants of the Vandals, because they look like Europeans. Well, I'm trying to have you understand that God or evolution, whichever one you want to choose to work with, is, works in mysterious ways. And I'm trying to have you understand that from a scientific point of view, that PN2 marker, that PN2 gene, ties 70 percent of the continent together and there's some other things that are basically only restricted to Africa except for the odd one you find outside groups A and B. This, this belongs to the E group. We can talk about that later but no what you're saying is that if you don't have some hard and fast boundaries then it's hard for you to work with certain things and I'm saying that would be like saying that if your son uh, if you had six sons and one of them moved to China and his descendants were only Chinese and one moved to Greenland and his descendants were only Inuit and another son moved to, I don't know, the Amazon and his descendants were only, you know, folks from the Amazon, that they wouldn't be your relatives. That would not patently be not true. 
Genealogically, they would all be connected to you because you're the grandpa. They're still connected. The idea, the physical similarity will always track with relationship is what we're trying to get. I'm trying to dispel you of that notion because it's not always true. And so there's sometimes people who may look very similar or, or when you measure certain things, they may appear to be similar based on the math. But in actual fact, using other measures and, and other kinds of information, you know that that can't possibly be true. You know, so, if, so when I go down to, uh, when I go up to, uh, you know, when I go to some village in the Sudan and I say, that guy looks just like God conference in London. I mean, they must be, oh, no, it's not your twin brother. You know, it's an accident. <coughs> It's an accident. There is something in physical anthropology and evolutionary bio biology called polytopicity. And polytopicity was a problem for uh, early evolutionary biologists uh, who were interested in taxonomy and classification. Why? Because polytopicity refers to the fact that you have similar looking groups of organisms uh, or you have a group of organisms in one place that looks very similar to another group of organisms in another in terms of whether it was their wing shape, their morphology, in terms of things that you can measure. But the dilemma was, should you group these things together when one was 10,000 miles away from the other and there was no way that, that one got from one place to the other? In other words, they were not closely historically connected. So it's called polytopicity. It's one of the problems with the subspecies concept for zoologists and subspecies concept in zoology is the same as the race idea for human beings. Only with human beings there's even more problems than there were for the zoologists. Problem of classification. So uh, my human example of polytopicity is certain people from Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea and those places who for everybody who just sees them on the street based on your own social experience you say oh, they, oh these look like Africans. Are, are they, are these are Africans. Well, no they're not. No they're not. Their lineage DNA says they're not. Where they live says they're not. And their languages definitely put them very far afield. But they live in tropical climates. Modern humans were tropical to begin with. Are these retentions from early migrations? Or are they just reacquisitions re of tropical traits? Now, no one can answer that. But their DNA clearly ties them to Asia. I mean, the lineage DNA. And there's some other interesting things about DNA too. Uh, other markers, okay, other, and I have to finish now. Other markers clearly, uh, in terms of lines of descent, tie together uh, not just simply all of humanity. You can forget that there's some other more sp specific markers that tie people from China all the way to Africa together. And it's like amazing. That's the YAP marker. You know, and there used to be a debate, did the YAP marker arise in Africa, arise in Asia? If you say the YAP marker arose in Asia, then you're saying most of all Africans today came from Asia. Now, I know certain people don't want to hear that, you know, those who are ideologically oriented in particular ways. So no, you know, and, but the proof, so to speak, is that number one, that wasn't very logical based on the dates of the emergence of the YAP marker. But also within Nigeria today, they found some people who have the YAP marker uh, well, I, that's a long story, but anyway, it, it sort of submits that Africa is the, the place of origin for this particular marker. Okay? At that time, when the Homo sapiens first emerged from Africa, they were Negroes at that time. What do you mean? No, I don't Sapi use that, no, I don't use that uh, term Negro. Yeah, I don't mean Sat. I'm just trying to make a strong point. Were they black of a black race? Well, in, ter in terms of their skin color, they would have been dark based on ecological principles. Based on principles, that's our guess. Do we have any empirical you proof? You could be dark and Asian, or you could be dark and black, for what I'm saying. Sorry to word, use the word Negro, but at the time, would they have been Negroes coming out of Africa? I don't know what you mean by Negro, and I wouldn't use that word. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that word. No. A black man, maybe. Yeah, well, if they, no, no, I will say that they were dark, and I don't know how dark. And they had limb ratios that are tropical, that you find in the tropics today, okay? Those are all things that, from based on biological principles, would tie them to where they are. And, 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 and most people, and most scientists would say, yes, they would have been dark. How dark, I can't tell you. 
They, they wouldn't have been blonde, no, if that's what you're asking. If that's the hidden question underneath, so no, they wouldn't have been blonde. In other words, Africa, they would have been African, from Africa, they would have been... At that moment in time, you're talking about a species history. Sorry. Okay? Okay, it, it's we a need different to just issue. wind down now. There's no more questions. You're welcome to talk to Shamaka with the coffee and teas. Uh, what I'd like to do is thank you for an excellent workshop. Um, Really enjoyed that. I'm sure other people have, even if they might have been quiet, they were absorbing it all, I'm sure. Okay, so thank, thank you, you Shamaka. Thank you. It was nice to be here.